Good morning again. I'm Peter Slinger, University of Toronto, Department of Anesthesia and Continuing Education. I'd like to welcome you to our annual Mendelssohn Lecture. This is actually a bit of a pilot project for us. This year, we're video conferencing to the other anesthesia departments in the University of Toronto and also through the Ontario Telemedicine Network to the rest of the province. And we're also webcasting. And I'd like to introduce Bev Orser, who's the chair of our anesthesia department at the University of Toronto, who will introduce this year's Mendelssohn speaker. Right. Well, good morning. And thank you, Peter. Welcome to everyone here and everybody who's listening on telemedicine. So it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Fisher today. But before, I just want to take a minute to comment about Marie Mendelssohn, who's the person who started these rounds, and his family, who established the rounds in order to recognize his many contributions to Toronto General Hospital's Department of Anesthesia at the time and the specialty. So he was born in 1928 in Toronto. And then, like many of his generation, and perhaps some folks here, undertook medical school training and then went out to practice rural medicine. And then he came back and finished his residency in 1962 and then spent all of his practice years here providing anesthetic care, investigating, focusing on the endocrine system and physiology. And you'll see this theme coming up, I think, in Joe's lecture, the tight relationship between physiology, the Department of Physiology, and our practice of anesthesia. In fact, this link goes even one step further. And I learned recently that Murray Mendelssohn's close relative, possibly sister, and I want to find this out for sure, is married to Harold Atwood, who was sister, right? Yeah, sister. So Mrs. Atwood is Murray's sister, and of course, physiology was Harold's department. And so the link runs and continues to run very closely. So we thank the Mendelssohn family for arranging this lecture and the opportunity to focus on physiology and science. So, Joe Fisher. It's really a pleasure and an honor and timely, and I know I said it'd be short. As our profession and our department moves towards this notion of transforming perioperative care through discovery and innovation, I would say Joe was generations ahead of all of us. Bar none, he is one of the most productive, innovative folks in our department. And I'll explain why in a minute. He graduated um, 1973 from medical school and then completed residency both in anesthesia in 1980, internal medicine 81. And then he went on to do research training with Bill Novo and then Jim Duffin and worked very closely with the physiologist here at the University of Toronto. And since then, he's been working, uh, providing anesthetic care, but doing more than that. He's had a very active research program focusing on cardiorespiratory physiology, control of blood gases, uh, cardiac output, produced many papers. But he is very unique in one way, and that is he has produced over 40 patents. So that's got to be bar none. Uh, a record for our department, perhaps even a record at the university. In order for a discovery to be patentable, it needs to be new, it needs to be useful, but most importantly, it is non-obvious. And this is the gift of Joe, is that he's able to see not only what is, but what can be. And he's able to see beyond the obvious and, and discover and move the specialty forward. And we'll be hearing about some of his discoveries today. Not only is he a wonderful investigator and a terrific clinical colleague, he's a recognized teacher and he's received almost all of the teaching awards that this department has to offer. So I want you to please welcome Joe Fisher, anesthesiologist, discoverer, and teacher. I want to uh, thank Bev uh, for this uh, uh, embarrassing uh, introduction. Uh, I can tell you that uh, with all that, my biggest triumph today was that I remembered how to tie my bow tie. <laughs> and I wasn't sure I would <laughs> this morning. But anyway, um, what I'd like to do this morning is, uh, first of all, my conflict of interest is that I'm uh, the chief scientist at this uh, company, which is part of the uh, UHN. 
Uh, I'm going to uh, teach you something about the control of blood gases, the thing that uh, uh, we learned. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, four places where we applied this, just to show you that things off the beaten track. And um, at the end, I'm going to uh, take the position uh, of being a kind of senior guy and tell you what I've learned over the years and uh, justify the uh, Mendelssohn lecture. This is uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, sayings, but it's not totally correct. In order to attain the inconceivable, the impossible is not possible. But sometimes you don't know the difference between the inconceivable and the impossible. So I'll come back to that theme repeatedly. So about the blood gases. So here's, I'm just going to teach you something generic. You can take this home with you, maybe apply it elsewhere. All right, so here's the problem. So the problem is we wanted to target end tidal PCO2. So we can administer the uh, carbon dioxide, that's no problem. We can measure the CO2 production, that's no problem. Uh, but how uh, do we control the alveolar ventilation? This is a problem. You look down, here's the lung, and the alveolar ventilation is the gas that gets into that little thing there at the end, right there. Now, everybody knows you can't measure or control that because of where it is. This is from Leon Fari and Herman Ron. Uh, probably two of the most uh, uh, famous, most people who contributed most to the field of cardiorespiratory physiology. And they say right here, uh, there is no method which will produce an exactly predetermined change in alveolar ventilation. There is no method, right? It just can't be done because of the anatomy. But what they're saying is that it's inconceivable. So let's see how difficult it is. So exhaled gas equilibrates with the alveoli. Not a big deal. And it doesn't contribute to gas exchange. So if you re-inhale it, nothing happens. So only the fresh gas in the alveoli contributes to your PCO2. Not really earth-shaking. So what if we washed out all the fresh gas from the dead space into the alveoli with rebreathed gas? So going back to this diagram, basically you inhale the gas that you want to control your PCO2, then you wash it down with some uh, previously exhaled gas, and you get that into the alveoli, and whatever exhaled gas you get in uh, with the red arrow over there, uh, that won't contribute to the gas exchange. So uh, how, how can we do that? So this must be very difficult, right? You must need high tech here. Uh, so this is where the three valves come in from the uh, title. So here are the valves. There's a uh, ex inspiratory valve. There's an expiratory valve. And this is basically just a demand regulator, or you can look at it as just a peep valve. And we have some gas in here, which is going to be the neutral gas that will have the same PCO2 as what's in your arterial gas. So uh, let's just walk through one big breath, let's say. So you start off at the FRC. There's no gas exchange being taking place over here because it's already equilibrated. So as you breathe in, you get all this oxygen stuff until the bag collapses, right? And then at that point, the only place you can get the gas will be from the demand regulator, and you just keep breathing it in. So the interesting thing here is that what gas is going to change your uh, blood gases? It's only this stuff, right? The other stuff that you breathed in had 5% CO2, which I told you had the same PCO2 as your arterial blood. So it's going to do nothing. So in this way, you have complete control over the alveolar ventilation. Suddenly, it's not so impossible. 
So if uh, somebody breathes on this circuit, for example, this is minute ventilation, they increase their minute ventilation, their end tidal PCO2 goes down, that's expected. On the circuit, as they increase their minute ventilation, their inspired PCO2 goes up proportional to the increase in ventilation, and the end tidal doesn't change. And this is completely passive. You know, there's no computers, no nothing. It just happens. So let's look at some applications. So uh, the first one that I want to tell you about is carbon monoxide poisoning. There are many little lessons to learn uh, from this little experience that we had. So carbon monoxide <clears throat> in the lung, uh, there's oxygen, there's some carbon monoxide. The reason you get poisoned is because your uh, red cells, your hemoglobin, has an affinity 270 times for carbon monoxide as it has for the oxygen. So you don't need much of a concentration of carbon monoxide. This is the equation, which uh, tells you the carbon monoxide and the oxyhemoglobin, you end up with carboxyhemoglobin. We want to drive the equation the other way, so we use the mass action effect. So we increase the oxygen here, we increase the oxygen, you increase the oxygen even more to hyperbaric levels to drive the equation in this way. But hyperbaric chambers are scarce. They're very expensive. Transporting patient takes time. Uh, there's no evidence that a hyperbaric chamber does anything for carbon monoxide poisoning, by the way. And time is brain, another theme I'm going to come back to uh, occasionally. So what can we do normal barrack? So this is an article from, uh, not me, uh, this is from Boston. This is the Great War in Zappal. So the idea here, uh, notice by the way the date, I want you to keep track of these dates here. Uh, so what he did was he took a fiber optic and he put it down, he, he noticed that that light on hemoglobin decreases its affinity for carbon monoxide. Go figure, great discovery. So he takes fiber optics and he puts it down the rat's uh, lungs and into his pleura and into the esophagus and shines light and just ventilates them normally. And uh, if he does say so himself, this is an innovative therapeutic strategy for carbon monoxide, treatment of carbon monoxide poisoning. Notice the date there. All right, this is science translational medicine. This journal has a uh, impact factor that's so high my nose would bleed if I went anywhere near the place, all right? And this is from Gladwin in uh, Pittsburgh, a uh, well-known guy as well. And you can't see the date there, but it says 2016 on that, uh, in the yellow highlight over there. And uh, they did something that only smart people can do. This is neuroglobin, which I'd never heard of in my life. And they somehow, these smart guys, they reconfigured it molecularly so that it would have a bigger affinity for carbon monoxide. You know, very clever, I think. So, um, so at the end of the day, you infuse this into the blood and it sucks the carbon monoxide out of the red cells. But if you do that, uh, you'd have to inject about uh, 50 to 100 grams, which I figured, I calculated out, comes out to about one to two liters. And then at the end of that time, all you get is sort of a 15% drop, uh, 10 to 15% drop in your carboxyhemoglobin. So, you know, in this graph, which uh, is scientifically not correct, by the way, it, despite the fact of the impact factor of the journal, um, even in this one, it shows that you get a, a benefit and then nothing. And all you save here is just a few minutes in time. So what's the idea? This is, this is a crazy idea. If any of you go for this, you know, you need psychiatric examination. So the idea is maybe I can hyperventilate to reduce the, the, uh, the uh, carboxyhemoglobin. And, and that shouldn't work, right? Because hyperventilating doesn't change the oxygen, doesn't change the affinity, it doesn't change the carbon monoxide level, it doesn't do any of that. So this is like, it's inconceivable that this would work. Somebody comes to you with this, you'd say, ah, you know, I don't think it'll work. And there's a killer but. Come on, Joe. If you hyperventilate the patient, the PCO2 will go down, the brain blood flow will go down, the patient will get worse. So not only aren't you going to help them, you're going to make them worse. Go back into the OR. So the thinking is like this, all right, 
So uh, there's a large amount of carbon monoxide on the blood because it has high affinity for it. Uh, that uh, maintains a good gradient uh, from the blood into the uh, alveolus. So therefore, if I ventilate normally, I'll get rid of this many blue dots of carbon monoxide. But let's say I tripled my ventilation. Because I can keep up with it, maybe I'll get rid of three times as much carbon monoxide, and maybe it'll make a difference. And I already had the uh, method of uh, maintaining isocapnia. So the, the killer butt you know, is not such a big problem anymore here. Uh, but will it work? So we had a volunteer uh, who was anesthetized, exposed to carbon monoxide, and then was treated with air, oxygen, and, um, and isocapnic hyperpnea, IH, and we measured uh, carboxyhemoglobin every five minutes just to see you know, how much an effect uh, th this would have. All right. So on the y-axis here, you've got carboxyhemoglobin as uh, in, in a log scale so that the slope gives you the rate of elimination. Okay, so uh, this is on room air, this is on oxygen as expected, and this is what happens when you do IH. I figured, holy macro, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna publish this. But unfortunately, Ludwig says you're not publishing this. <laughs> he says we have to try it and compare it to hyperbaric to see how it compares, you know. So um, uh, we, uh, we went through this uh, where we had to get him somehow to the hyperbaric chamber. So we put the dog on a stretcher. We put pillows here and there to make it look like a patient because we had to get through the, the clinical wards in, in the hospital. And um, we got them to let us use the, the uh, patient. We, uh, put the, we, we put the dog in, in the hyperbaric chamber. We increased the O2. What happens? I'm in there with the dog. What happens in the hyperbaric chamber? He's not happy. He's not happy. He wakes up. The pressure reversal of anesthesia? Go figure. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, <clears throat> didn't make that, uh, that mistake with the second dog. <laughs> um, and uh, when we looked at the data, the, the data was pretty good. You know, it looked like it was very steep, so basically, uh, I superimposed these two, uh, these two curves just to get an idea of, of uh, the relative effect, and it looked like it was at least as good, right? If anything, it's, it's steeper than, than, the, um, than the hyperbaric chamber. And this is in all the animals on air, oxygen, oxygen, and, and IH. And this is half time, so the shorter the half time, the faster. So it's at least as good as the hyperbaric chamber. Oh, my God, this was terribly exciting. Um, uh, this was done, as Bev said, again in the department. There are many people here. There's Josh Rucker. Uh, there's, of course, Ludwig. And uh, you'll see many of these people in our department you know, come across in these, uh, in, in these things that, that we did. Uh, by the way, if you look down here, you'll see the date over here was, I think, uh, 1999. I can't see it uh, on there. Remember the, the dates on the other guys? 1999. All right. Um, okay, it works. Nice trick, uh, but there's no way this could be practical in humans. That was the next, the next thing that you know people were saying. So uh, there we go again. So uh, we went, we uh, did a study, and uh, we went to IRB. Yes, we got IRB to uh, expose people to carbon monoxide and treat them this, but they had to be anesthesiologists. So uh, Ludwig and I would run up to the. Um, uh, to the lounge, we'd grab people, and it was quite interesting. There was a difference between the males and the females. In the males, uh, uh, they didn't mind breathing the carbon monoxide, but when you start an ID on them, you'd think you were cutting off their hand. You know, they'd be grimacing and, and, and you know, moving all over the place. The females, no problem with the IV. They didn't even notice it. But even before we gave them the carbon monoxide, they were already feeling dizzy and lightheaded. <laughs> anyway, so... Oh, oh. Uh, important lesson there. Uh, the lesson here was that you only have to increase your um, minute ventilation a little bit uh, to get 85% of the benefit of uh, carbon monoxide. And that's about 15 liters a minute, which for me would be what I breathe when I walk up one or two flights of stairs. So maybe it is practical. And we'd apply the same circuit to it. 
And what happens, the reason it works is that there's 5% CO2, so the CO2 uh, remains constant, but it's 5% CO2 in oxygen, so you get all this oxygen, so you get the value of the hyperoxia as well as the hyperventilation. So uh, this looked like a good thing. So the circuit is really simple. You can really make it, but you don't have to because it already exists, and it looks like this. So um, the, the, uh, the valves, the inspiratory and expiratory valves are right here, the non-rebreathing valve. You put uh, the oxygen in there, the demand regulator there, and in red you see the two reservoir bags. In other words, our self-inflating bag that we use every day is exactly the circuit you need. You're done. So we built a little uh, device like this where the oxygen, the uh, CO2 and the oxygen go in, and just with any self-inflating bag, and you can treat anybody uh, as well as in the hyperbaric chamber for carbon monoxide poisoning. All right, so you eliminate carbon monoxide, but the patients actually get better if you eliminate carbon monoxide. It would seem obvious to you and me, but the FDA said, yeah, you have to prove that. So uh, we're not going to prove that, but somebody else did. In uh, this journal, uh, we noticed that there was this uh, article, and the, the, I couldn't read the other stuff, but the, the clearmate words were there. So uh, we got that. We got it translated, and here's what they did. Uh, for between these dates, they looked at 320 patients. They treated them with hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, within these dates, they had 319 patients, and they treated them as soon as they could with the clearmate, right at the scene, in the ambulance, on arrival to the emergency department before they got into the hyperbaric chamber. So what happened? Well, uh, they regained consciousness in a third of the time. The delayed neurological sequelae, which are 25 to 40% normally, were down to 1%. And uh, when they followed them up at two years, about 80% were good to excellent in the regular treatment. With the hyperbaric, with, with the clearmate, all of them were, 99%. Time actually is brain. All right, application two, sequential gas control of arterial blood gases is something that we do at the UHN. Uh, most of the studies are done in the Toronto Western, but we do some of them here. Uh, I think uh, Venkat presented this already. Uh, I'm just going to go over it, uh, you know, fairly uh, quickly over here. So I got a call in 1998 from this guy who's a neuroradiologist at the Western, and he wanted a whole bunch of stuff. You know, he wanted to control the CO2, he didn't want to change the O2, he wanted to do this, he wanted to do that, you know, all of which are, uh, and, oh yeah, and he, we couldn't use any metal because he wanted it to do it in the MRI, and all of this was ridiculous, and he knew it because he had asked lots of people, but, you know, a student told him to, to ask me. Well, uh, we published our first paper with this uh, a few months later. And uh, this is basically what we did. Our f the first uh, device that we had looked like this, and it was uh, made actually by George Volgesi. Some of our older uh, colleagues here should uh, well remember George Volgesi, who was at the Sick Kids and then later uh, worked with me. Eventually, it became the third generation uh, device, which was this. These are the guys that uh, did this. This is Murat Slesarev, who was a reject uh, because his uh, his uh, supervisor lost a grant, and he had no place to go, so he sat in my lab, so I put him on this uh, project over here. And uh, he not only developed the math behind the targeting, but also wrote the program and uh, did the automation. Uh, very talented guy. This other guy uh, basically single-handedly uh, developed and ran the whole program. He was infatigable, weekends, nights. <laughs> he was infatigable. We have a huge uh, database, over 1,000 patients, um, much thanks to, this, to that guy. Uh, we had to change the, uh, the uh, uh, geometry of this a little bit. So instead of a, a tank with neutral gas, we just took the exhaled gas. And we did this because we were targeting several different uh, PCO2s, and the neutral gas uh, had to be specific for that. We couldn't have a, a, a blanket neutral gas. And this works basically exactly the same way. They breathe in, and basically now the, the, uh, this is the uh, neutral gas, and uh, the gas that we use to uh, target a PCO2 uh, is over here. So the program 
again, this was presented previously, but I'll briefly review it here. Uh, when we started, it uh, seemed totally far-fetched. So basically, uh, they have a stimulus, which they used uh, CO2 for, and then uh, there's physiological and pathological changes that go on in the brain and the signal. There's a the machine, there's settings, 3D localization was a problem, there's signal drift. In the end, they end up with a MRI signal, and uh, <clears throat> they try to normalize it for the CO2, which was ludicrous, and then they somehow try to <clears throat> uh, determine some pathology that's uh, in the brain. Give me a break, right? You know, that, that is definitely far-fetched. So we went to work on this. You know, David uh, realized that, and uh, we went to work on this. So the first thing we did is you have to realize that when you breath hold or inhale CO2, you don't know how much CO2 you get in the arterial system. You don't know how long it lasts. Every patient is different, even though you give them the same. It is, it is foolish to have anything like that, and dividing it by the PCO2 is ridiculous as well. Uh, what's the PCO2 in somebody who's holding their breath? Right? It was totally ridiculous to start with. So we developed, yeah, I showed you the first two. This is the fourth generation of the device which controls the arterial blood gases. Uh, this thing sits beside the magnet. This sits in the control room. And now we have a virtual circuit. We don't have those bags and things anymore. And uh, we control the PCO2 very precisely. The blue dots are uh, the target, the black dots are the actual, and this looks like it's easy. You just find whatever it is and you do it. Every breath is different. Every breath is recalculated and has different inspired uh, concentrations. This is some of the work uh, from uh, more sophisticated stuff that was started by Murat Slesarev. And then this lady, who's uh, Olivia Sobchik, who's the uh, graduate student, uh, she came back and we started to normalize the physiology to be able to take it into account when we're uh, doing our, our uh, images and calculations. She standardized the machine and the settings, and then we ended up with uh, a ways to actual uh, get at the pathology. I'm just going to show you this uh, briefly again. These are two patients, uh, both with complete carotid stenosis on both sides. Uh, this guy has it on the right. So we give them a change in PCO2, and with this scale, the redder it is, the bigger the change in blood flow in the, in the scale. And, uh, and contrary-wise, as, uh, as the colors get more dark blue, there's a reduction in blood flow. So there's a redistribution of blood flow from uh, the bad side to the good side in this patient, and this is characteristic of a hemodynamically significant uh, lesion. So the next guy should have the same, but he doesn't. He's got normal CDR. So what is going on here? So both patients have uh, decreased carotid flow. Both of them are completely occluded. Uh, this guy has no vasodilatory reserve. This guy has a robust CDR and with vasodilatory reserve, and this must come from collateral blood flow. So this becomes a test of the presence of collateral blood flow. So that if you don't have collateral blood flow, it is well known that there's a very high risk of stroke. It doesn't matter how you do the CDR, what you use, it has a high risk of CDR. And uh, we feel that uh, there's a decreased risk of stroke if there is good collateral blood flow. So Venkat went back and he looked at our database. He pulled out uh, 109 patients uh, 76 were impaired, and, seven, and 24 had normal CDR. They had just as bad uh, arteries, but their CDR was normal. So some of these that, that had impaired CDR uh, had no intervention, so that when you follow these guys up at one year, it's really interesting. The guys that had bad CDR and intervention had a 3% incidence of stroke. Those that had no intervention at 12%, and those that had just as bad occluded arteries, but had normal CDR, had none. These are some of the people uh, <laughs> to whom I, uh, we owe all this uh, work, not just to uh, the two that I pointed out. So, th so this, is, um, this is the main course of the meal, right? This is your entree. This is the big thing that I want to talk about uh, over here. Before, I was just sort of uh, giving you some uh, background. So this is really important. So uh, uh, it's going to be about cardiac output, and 
Uh, I've been thinking about that ever since I worked with Bill Noble way back in the 1980s, and I couldn't figure out exactly uh, how to do this. And, and throughout all this time, I really couldn't figure it out. I took on a, a graduate student, uh, a master's student, who have to be an engineer, and uh, you know we were going through, I was teaching them some of the background that we had, three little valves, this, that, and the other. And from the mouth of babes, uh, he comes up with a solution that has, um, that has eluded uh, 100 years of very smart people in the field, and me too. <laughs> So uh, let, let me just get everybody up to date. I'll just give you a brief uh, background of what we're talking about. This is just sort of you know, the, the primer so that everybody's on the same page. So basically, cardiac output, if you look at FIC, we basically look at the arterial content of oxygen here. We look at the venous content of oxygen here. We look at the oxygen consumption. And with this little simple relationship, we can calculate out the cardiac, we can solve for the cardiac output. And this is a gold standard method because everything is measured, right? So uh, one of the early things that we did, I told you I was interested in this topic, was again with uh, Jay, Jim Duffin, Ludwig, uh, Leonid Minkovich, uh, Max, uh, Rita, you know, uh, in the group, we went to see if we can uh, at least get rid of one of these, make one of them uh, non-invasive, uh, which is what we did. Uh, in this paper. So we designed a method where the arterial is exactly equal to the end tidal. So we, and you're no better off by taking an arterial stab than you are looking at the end tidal if you use sequential gas delivery, which is the three little valves that I'm talking about. So everybody was very happy. This, but there's, that wasn't the, this is the big issue. How did, do you get at that without a catheter, the mixed venous? So the traditional way is you put a cap on the breathing and you wait for some equilibration with the carbon dioxide. That's a traditional way. And, uh, and here's the problem. There's a killer butt. There's always a killer butt, right? So yeah, you get 95% equilibration. Uh, it takes about 90 seconds. The butt, circulation time is only 20 seconds. So what happens is that if you breath hold there, your PCO2 goes up in this type of fashion. That's great, except for the fact that your circulation time is there, your, end, your uh, mixed venous ends up up there, and now you've got a different trajectory. So you can never get there, right? So we say, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, extrapolate, I, you know, I'll get a couple breaths. But from two or three breaths, you can't extrapolate an exponential like this. Your error is so large that you know, there's no point. You might as well just guess. So you say you start closer. Yeah, yeah, sure, you can start closer, having them breathe more. But the time constant is about the same. And you're worse off now because you can't take any breaths here because they're all pretty flat because you started off closer. So you're no better off there. And then you can dither. You can iterate. You can say higher, lower, higher, lower, until I get you know the, the equal. And this was done, uh, but it's certainly not clinically practical and not automatable. It may be good for the lab at some point. So there's, there was no conceivable solution. And there was no conceivable solution for me either for you know, 30, 40 years until uh, I had a student who had an idea. <laughs> so, so here's the idea. So uh, he calculates cardiac output in three rounds. Now, uh, you may not all get this, but you know, just try to look at this from a you know, 30,000 foot level. I'm just gonna try to give you an overall thing. This is so simple that I had to think about it for days before I, I could come to terms with it, you know? Um, so uh, he gives a bolus of CO2 uh, on breath one. Now using sequential gas delivery, using what we do, he knows exactly how much went into the alveolus. He knows exactly, right? And then he looks at the end tidal PCO2. So now uh, we measure that, and you can calculate how much CO2 actually went in from the cardiac output into the alveolus. So you can, you can guess, pretty well guess, calculate a, a Q. You know, just take a rough guess at the, at the cardiac output. And for the rest of the breaths, he uses the same method that we use in the MR to target. I showed you breath by breath. You use that same method to target uh, that uh, thing using the cardiac output. Ah but you don't get a good result. You're targeting this, 
and you get this. You get a progressive reduction in the CO2. Ah, no good. No, it's fabulous because the rate that this goes down tells you how far off you are in the cardiac output, right? It gives you information. So he takes that information, he recalculates using a differential thick, and then he goes into round two and he does it again. So again, the four breaths, and yes, he's, he's doing better, but he still knows exactly how much he's off in that cardiac output. He can calculate back. So then he hits the uh, actual uh, cardiac output, and uh, he does the same test. He targets this line, and he pretty well gets it. And the only way he can get that is if he had the correct cardiac output. So it's a validation. So basically, uh, it turns out that in these first three rounds, when you don't know anything about the patient, and these rounds take about 45 seconds each, after three rounds, you're 95%, at least 95% of the way to his real cardiac output. Right? And isn't this clever? The four breaths take less than one circulation time. That's the thing that nobody was able to solve. And this, out of the mouth of babes, <laughs> is the solution. And uh, not only did Michael do that, but he built uh, the device that we used to test it. Uh, he took away the bags and he built a, a little manifold. Uh, this is all Michael. And then we tested on some pigs. I'm going to show you the data in a moment. Uh, so this is round one. Uh, then he recalculates round two, recalculates uh, round three, and there you are. Uh, this is the data from pigs undergoing uh, orthoptic liver transplant. So everything's going on, you know, fluids going in, clamping, unclamping, and uh, the uh, boxes are thermodilution, an average of three, and the black dots are a continuous cardiac output where he presses go on the box, which I showed you, and then collects the data at the end of the experiment. So uh, this is not only a gold standard because everything is measured, it's self-validating. We don't have another one like that. It's safe. CO2 is the only marker. It doesn't accumulate. And it's versatile. You can use it for spontaneous ventilation. It works as well as, you know, uh, ventilation. All right? Now, that was the main course. Now, I hope this becomes dessert. So, um, so this is another one. So, okay, to hell with the three little valves. Let's do something else or something else that was very exciting. I liked it. So I had a graduate student which seemed perfect for the job, Dahlia Balaban. All right, and what we're going to look at is diaphragmatic and intercostal muscle coordination as you go into respiratory failure. So uh, look here, Dali. You see, I got some, I got some xylocaine here. I just spray it into my nose, and then I pass the esophageal probe uh, down into my esophagus. Look, I love it. It's it's great. You should do it too. Uh, she, <laughs> You know, uh, she tries it, everything's fine, she's a happy camper, and then we're going to exercise to exhaustion. Uh, Joe, um, uh, is there another project I can do? <laughs> well, okay, you don't want to do that. All right, back to the three little valves. Um, we're going to go to Bolivia, right? And uh, we're going to do in vivo oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay? It's been done before, but only in dogs and published in, in uh, Science Magazine. Only in dogs. Never been done in humans and never in spontaneous ventilation. We're going to do it in lowlanders at sea level, which is going to be us, after acclimatization, which is us. And we have to go to Bolivia because we have to compare it to uh, Andean highlanders. Sure, you don't want to use that lidocaine and swallow the esophageal. Uh, anyway, so uh, everybody knows this is not possible because as you lower the PCO2, as you lower the PO2, people hyperventilate and you can't keep the PCO2 constant, so you don't know what it is. So the oxymoral association curve, you don't know where it is. You can't, you know. So it, it's it's actually it can't be done. But anyway, we fly to this place, which is La Paz in Bolivia. And uh, we go down, we come down this road. I'll show you a few pictures. Uh, La Paz is uh, inside 
uh, this crater over here. It's the only city in the world where the real estate becomes more expensive as you go down. Usually, as you get higher in the city, the real estate becomes more expensive. But I guess uh, people pay money to be able to breathe. So uh, this is the view as uh, we're going down the road and we're approaching uh, La Paz. And it is, in parts, a very beautiful modern city. There's still very traditional Spanish uh, parts uh, in there uh, with beautiful little streets uh, to walk around. And uh, this is most of the city looks like this. And uh, this is the group. There's Marat Slesarev, which you may recognize from, from the previous one. This is Alexandra Mardamai, who did a master's with me. By the way, I gathered up all the master's students that I had. That's who these people are. Um, there's David Price, who's now an anesthesiologist working at uh, uh, Brigham Women's in, in, uh, in uh, Boston. Alex Vesley, now also an anesthesiologist. They're all students at this time, uh, who's now an anesthesiologist in BC. And there's Dahlia. So we get uh, squared away. We find a place to set up our equipment. We actually built uh, one of these little respiracty things that we can take on an airplane that will fit in an overhead uh, uh, compartment, basically put together with a little bit of solder and some pink tape and things like that, nothing really sophisticated. Um, we needed to put in art lines into everybody. <laughs> so uh, maybe Dali might have wanted to change her mind, but here she is smiling again with her art line and ready to go. And uh, so uh, the protocol said that you get progressively hypoxic over here, all right? Uh, and keep the PCO2 constant. Do you notice this number over here? 30. Yeah? So in the end, we have the world's first oxygen globe association curve in vivo, in humans, ta-da. All right, so where is all this leading? So, uh, you know, uh, when, when you see an, an album uh, by a singer and it says greatest hits, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, great, you know they're washed up. So this was my greatest hits, <laughs> all right? So this was my greatest hits. But uh, the other side is that I get, to, I get to pontificate a bit and tell you uh, what I learned about the uh, creative process, uh, which many of you, I think, are, are stumbling along. And hopefully, this may be helpful and helpful to all of us. So there's a few lessons. And uh, as I say, the inconceivable doesn't mean impossible. To some people, if they can't conceive it, it is impossible. In that case, when you do it, uh, they don't believe you. You become a liar, right? Or you're a magician. But you're neither. You know, if it's if it's just inconceivable but not impossible, uh, then uh, I oh. okay. Um, so uh, when you need to solve a problem, if you go down the same road, you'll end up in the same destination. So you want to cure carbon monoxide? We need more oxygen. We need more oxygen. You'll end up in the same place with hyperbaric chamber. And that's true for every one of these, you know, the cardiac output, for everything. The reason that I, I couldn't do anything for about 35 or 40 years because I kept going down the same road and ended up in the same dead end, you know, with, with all the students. I just couldn't get off that road until Michael Klein came along. So I think you need to be a contrarian. Uh, just get off the beaten path. Yeah, all obvious things and all things that are complicated you know, taking neural globin and, and adding molecules and turning all these things have been done. And not only that, but they're not going to be done by you. Okay? We're scientists, true, but we're applied scientists. We give anesthetics, things like that. We don't sit except for Beth. We don't sit in the lab and, and make great scientific discoveries. You know, we just apply what we know. So uh, clearly, you already know everything that you need to know. Because the things you need to look for have to be absurd, because they have to be off the beaten track, and they have to be simple. All right? The killer butt is a killer. Because you get this good idea, or you get a student with a good idea, and then you come up with some, but how are you going to, you know, how are you, and that's usually a killer. You need to address that. And you know uh, the address the, to address that it, it was easy with three little valves. So everything you know was three little valves over and over again. We just figured out one way or the other. 
Um, the one that was different was this iterative approach, which, uh, I, you know, the three little valves got me arterial, but I, I just couldn't get into the mixed venous with that until this iterative approach had to get off. So even for me, I just couldn't get off the path. The other thing is, I'll tell you, this is true over and over again. You know, it looks in the end, like when, when I write the paper, I say, well, we thought this and this, and then so we did this, and that's how we got everything. But that's not how we got everything. We tried this, we tried that. We went here, we went that. This failed, that failed, you know? And then somebody had an idea, so we doubled this and singled that and so on and, and, and went away. You got to start somewhere because one thing leads to another. And you're not going to get there unless you go somewhere, unless you go down some blind alleys. You know, uh, science is basically finding all the blind alleys so that you can find the actual path. And, uh, and even though it looks like, oh, yeah, I did this, I did that, I didn't. You know, we went down plenty of blind alleys. Uh, this, I think, is something that everybody here can learn. Uh, we need to be encouraging colleagues and mentors because, you know, people always raise the flag and see who salutes, right? And often it dies there. You know, for everything that is a new idea, there's a thousand reasons why it won't work. But only one is required to kill. So what happens? People are met with some laughter, ridicule, of course, the killer butt, scientific unknowns. Oh, yeah, but we don't know this. We don't know that. You know, how do you know it's going to do this? Right. Oh, it's going to cost a fortune, you know, and nobody, will, you know, can't get anything. About that. OK, uh, Joe, it's not really anesthesia. You know, come on, you know, this, get, get off this. OK, so what's the real, the most killing words that kill every good idea? What is it? Anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> the idea is dead. As soon as those words, as soon as those words are uttered, the idea is dead. Because you, even if you go for the grant, which you won't, but even if you did, right? There's a thousand reasons why that won't work, why you shouldn't get the money why you have no track record, why the data, you know, the, the pilot study doesn't support, you know, uh, that, that them putting any money into it. It's too far flown. They want, for every grant, they want a small margin uh, above what is already known. But any sort of leap, it's gone. And the idea is gone. So what do you do to keep that idea? You need to defend every single idea. You need to take it apart and find the golden kernel. Because most of these ideas that are half-baked are half-baked, but they have a golden kernel. They have something in them that's a keeper. It may not be the total solution, but it's a keeper. And you could, you, you could massage it here and massage it there and you know, maybe use three vowels, maybe you do this, that, and the other, and you brainstorm. Okay, and you have to brainstorm in such a way that you can start because rule five kicks in. Just starting gets you some momentum and gets you someplace. And the other reason that you don't start, oh, sorry. Yeah, so here are the words, you write these down. Uh, okay, let's refine the idea uh, and let's try it out. Write that down. That's what you say next time, all right? Uh, the other reason not to apply for grants is that time is of the essence, okay? Um, ideas aren't unique. Um, uh, Eliza Gray, I tell this all the time, and the students, my students will, will recognize this. On February 14th, 1876, was the 29th uh, into the patent office, his lawyer was. Who was the fifth into the patent office? Anybody know? Alexander Graham Bell. So I heard it, oh, sorry, I heard it uh, uh, said in there. Times of the essence. Uh, this was uh, for 2000 from uh, Bob Banzett. This is the sequential rebreathing circuit from Bob Banzett. Too bad. I was at the patent office first. I was there three years before that. So by the time he published this, this is this great thing in Journal of Applied Physiology. I, I, I already had it in my pocket. All right. Uh, and this is now all those are important. 
this is the most important because all those uh, were, were, uh, were sufficient, this is necessary. Be an early adopter, and that, and I'm talking about the staff, the department, and uh, the institution. Um, if, if it isn't used at home, it won't make it anywhere. You won't get grants. Uh, nothing will happen. It has to be something that is used at home. And things are hard to adopt. Uh, it often costs money to adopt them, especially the kind of stuff that we do, right? You know, with the mechanical devices and things like that. You know, they ain't cheap. Uh, somebody has to pay for it, right? Uh, there always there's a risk. There's scientific uncertainty, and in the end, uh, you don't want to take those. So you say, ah, I'll just give them 100% oxygen. You know, it's it's too complicated. You know, I, I don't want to deal with that, and I don't want to deal with the committees. Uh, there's unions uh, that, that threatened to go on strike because they didn't want the extra work of, of, view, of applying carbon monoxide in, the, in, in ambulances. And uh, oh, there's all sorts of stuff. There's, uh, there's also, you know, people are people, and there's also people who don't like you or don't like you to be successful or whatever. And uh, most people, fortunately, follow this. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of support in most departments because it almost doesn't matter who scores the goal, the team is the one that wins. But it's very rewarding to be a, an early adopter because there's a vicious circle of, uh, sorry, a virtuous circle of a culture of in-house innovation. So new concepts and ideas beget new concepts and ideas. And then all sorts of things come along with that. You get visiting scientists, super specialization, you get referrals, commercialization, you get your pick of fellows. All sorts of great things come, including cash, grants, infrastructure, and all of that supports, again, new ideas. Once you get into this virtuous circle, I think it's an autopilot. I think things will just go. But to get there, you have to go through the elements that I just followed through. Be early adopters. Um, who said this? Anybody have any idea? Famous scientist, maybe? Does that give you a shiver up your spine? It, is, it does mine. Thank you very much for this opportunity. minutes for questions. Uh, maybe just for a second, if there's anybody at another center who wants to uh, ask a question. Okay. But then we just ask in the room, anybody, any thoughts? <laughs> I think you should talk in here. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe, because I was just saying that I consider anesthesiology the specialty of innovation. And we don't look back enough to see where we've been. And I really want to thank you for, for your talk today because there are investigators here listening and so forth. And, and the people who are going to move our specialty forward are the discoverers, innovators here. And I also want to point out a couple things about Joe, and that is his tenacity. And, and we all need that because we have to get over that hurdle. And, and Joe mentioned that uh, the most important thing you do is work with people who are smarter than you are. And uh, I don't believe that with Joe, but, but, but those people are in the room. So uh, thank you for your uh, inspirational talk. I just, I'd just like to ask, it would seem so simple to have a little cylinder of carbon monoxide uh, and one of your circuits on every fire truck everywhere. Uh, is there been any progress in that? Yeah, that's, that's a, it, it would be so simple to have that on, on the ambulances and so on. But it turns out it's not so simple and it just gets bogged down, you know. The, the EMTs don't have room on their ambulances to carry it, you know, so it would have to be, it would add to their clutter. It would add to their work, so they want more money. The union gets involved in that. Uh, there's committees at Sunnybrook Hospital. Uh, 
uh, that before they can recommend it, you know, and, and it just goes on and on, and it's just easier to give them 100% oxygen and forget about it. <laughs> okay, can I also ask about this? Uh, we are a hyperbolic hospital, right? I've been a hyperbolic physician for quite a while now, and we always have minimum two, two and a half hour time to set up a chamber to set up the team. By that time, in the severe poisoning, it's, it's a little late. Uh, our emergency department, we offered they didn't want that we are making the emergency department because it was too much, I don't know, political battle of introducing that. So the, the, the times might have changed, but it was a few years ago. That they, it's exactly what Joe said. We have to try and try and educate and try and push and push because solutions are there. You know, I, I presided over many, many carbon monoxide poisoning in the past with the sad results only because it took me six hours to get a patient in the chamber, which, as papers show, they are not effective. Why? Because it's late. That was my question, too. Why can't all the emergency departments by one of the nurse? You know, it's not very expensive. Because the decision is time. made by people who don't understand physiology. If, if it's not used, I, I was, so I went to China in, uh, in Guangdong province in 19... Uh, 19... No, in 2013 or something like that. And they wanted to put it throughout Guangdong province. They, they thought, they, they had done a study, which I didn't know about, but I showed you I showed you that study. That was all done without my knowledge. So they wanted to do that. And uh, so I knew that uh, I should have one here at the Toronto General at least. So I went to the emergency department. They refused to have it. I went to Bob Bell, who I knew well. I said, Bob, just buy one. He says, yeah, but my department doesn't want it. Says I don't care, just buy it. Just put it in the cupboard. Just, just, just buy it. He says no, I don't have a budget. I have to go to the budget committee. Okay, I'll give you two free and just put them in the in in the um, in the cupboard. And he says no, I can't do that. So I went to China. Uh, the first question they asked me was how many are being used at the Toronto General mm -hmm. Hospital. That was the first question. First, right? And when I said none. They closed their books, they closed their computers, they were very nice to me, they shook my hand, I got on the plane, I flew back to Toronto. And that was, and now there's, there's uh, you might be interested in this thing. Can anybody read this? <laughs> this company now is producing them in China, all right? And guess what we're gonna buy them from? The Toronto General will end up buying them from China. So that's the story, Sri. Okay. Thank you very much, Joe, again.